yes, as an entrepreneur, we're going to suffer some consequences. The consequences look very different as a decision maker who chooses the wrong vendor, who makes the wrong investment. So very, very different psychologically. And it's why so many of the strategies that folks are taught in terms of how to grow their business let's say in the online marketing or the solopreneur world, don't translate very effectively. You are listening to Amplify Your Success Podcast, episode 371. Today, you're going to learn how to win more corporate consulting and coaching clients with a simple process. You ready for this? Let's get started. Welcome to the Amplify Your Success Podcast. Get ready to ramp up your revenue, amplify your impact, and make your mark in the world. This is the show for experts, thought leaders, and service professionals who want to shatter their limits and achieve that next level. You're going to find out from other experts and influencers how they made it. Now, let's get Amplified. Hey there, inspired entrepreneurs and business leaders. It's your host, Melanie Benson, authority amplifier and possibility igniter for expert-based entrepreneurs that are ready to hit five and six-figure consistent revenue months. I am excited to share today's episode with you. Um, This was a really intriguing conversation, and you're going to want to get a pen and paper and take a lot of notes. Now, before I introduce our guest for today, Have you saved your seat for the Bold Growth Event? BoldGrowthEvent.com. It happens January 30th through February 1st. If you're listening to this later, you can still check this out. You do not want to miss this live experience. This transformational experience is being hosted just one time. And I am going to take you through a very powerful process over three days, 90 minutes each day with time for Q&A to help you move the needle on your business with ease and flow. I'm going to reveal how bold growth moves are going to catapult you this year, help you stand out as a recognized authority, and really move the revenue needle in a way that doesn't add a ton of work. Think of it the 10x model instead of the incremental 2x This is going to be very powerful and it's free. I'm not charging for this one. So you want to head over now before all the seats close to boldgrowthevent.com. Now, who is it for? This is for experts, coaches, service-based business owners, consultants, course creators who have their eye on a high six, seven, maybe even eight figure business. And even though you've been doing all the right things, you haven't been moving the needle the way you'd hoped and you suspect that maybe you could actually use an injection of big thinking and quantum energy to help you catapult the share. So if that's sounding exciting to you, I hope it does because this powerful process is going to change some lives and I hope it'll be yours. So head over to boldgrowthevent.com and nab your seat by registering there. Now let's get into today's episode. Welcome back, Amplifiers. I'm so excited to share today's conversation with you. We're talking about how to win corporate consulting and coaching clients. And we, oh my gosh, this guest, we have been in each other's orbit for years and years and years, I think 15 years, but let me give her an official welcome and introduction. Angelique Rewers. She is a small business growth expert. She's CEO of Bold House, recognized as an Inc. 5000 company with 25 years of experience. She's widely recognized for her no-nonsense approach in helping small and diverse businesses to win corporate clients. Now, uh, you can read her bio because she's got so many accolades but I want to hit some highlights here because I think it's it's impressive. She has had uh, her work recognized in Inc. Magazine, Business Digest Magazine, Forbes, Entrepreneur, CNBC, ABC, NBC, all of the acronyms, CBS, right? But what I loved, and Angelique, I am so moved by this. I didn't know this about you. She's also a humanitarian and has trained and consulted for organi- organizations like USAID, National Geographic, and the Smithsonian, and she sits on the advisory board for Space for Humanity. And 
uh, is on the committee for the United Nations Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund. I don't know how you have time for all of this, but I'm I so sleep. grateful that you're here. <laughs> I don't sleep. <laughs> I sleep that one hour between two and three in the morning where, you know, everybody's asleep, right? That's yeah. probably it for me. That's probably it. I think after I had my twins, I learned I didn't actually need sleep. So there you go. <laughs> That's impressive. Because if I don't get eight hours of sleep, you do not want to be near me. We're not going to have an effective conversation. <laughs> my family's like, go back to bed. No, don't be around okay. Melanie if she's had less than eight hours of sleep. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you for Thank being you. here today. And I, I've known of your work for years. So when you guys reached out, I was like, yes, yes, yes. We got to have this conversation because I think a lot of uh, people who are part of the Amplify community, their focus is on corporate clients. So get your notepad out, my friends, as you're listening in, you're going to want to take some great notes today. Well, let's dig in. I want to talk first about some of the myths and misconceptions about landing corporate consulting and coaching clients. Um, I think a lot of people, and, and I've coached people in this field for a very long time. I came out of the corporate marketplace. So I know a little bit about that side of it, but I actually chose not to make corporate consulting and coaching my my focus because for me, that didn't feel like where I, where I would be good. Like that did not feel like a good fit for me. And I know a lot of people have myths about this. So let's let's get those on the table first, Angelique. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the big ones is actually the one you just talked about, and it happens to a lot of folks, right, when they leave corporate because they're leaving due to burnout and due to the toxicity in the organization. They're sort of like, if you remember those old Kool-Aid commercials where the Kool-Aid pitcher would just go busting through the wall, and that's how a lot of these corporate escapees feel. And so the downside is oftentimes they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if you'll forgive the expression, in that they had some just incredible mojo while they were a professional in corporate. They were doing big things. They had lots of resources, they had teams, they had connections. And then all of a sudden, after that recovery, they kind of continue to play small. And there's this idea that if I go back to corporate, it's going to feel like it did when I was an employee. So I think that's one of the big myths when folks realize that it's it's very different when you're on the outside. Another big myth that we hear is that it takes a long time to win corporate clients, which is a total fallacy. I mean, I work in the B2C space now with solopreneurs and, and small enterprises at, who are selling into corporate. But, you know, it's interesting because we'll have folks who everyone in your community, I'm sure Melanie knows what a list is, right? So we'll have folks, quote unquote, on our list um, who have been in our orbit for years and years and years. In fact, we just hosted our annual conference in Fort Lauderdale and we had a woman who come up, came up to me and she said, I heard you speak nine years ago and I'm finally ready to work with you and to be here. And I'm, you know, I'm finally ready. So the idea that one category of clients moves at a different speed than another category of clients is a fallacy um, that you have corporate clients who can pull the trigger within 24 hours because there's an emergency and you have ones that will take years, just like in the solopreneur space or the mid-market space or any space. So that's, I think, probably the other really big one. People attribute certain things to corporate that in fact, are absolutely the same across every target market out there. And so those assumptions and those limiting beliefs really causes people to leave a lot of opportunity on the table. Mm. I, yeah. But I'm so glad you talked about those because those are definitely things that I've had in my head over the years. Well, let's talk about the converse for a second before we go any deeper. You know, we've talked about some things that people might be kind of have as a limiting belief around focusing on corporate consulting, but what is the opportunity here? Like, why do you think this is such a good focal point for um, solopreneurs? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it takes the same amount of time and effort to win 
a hundred thousand dollar opportunity, a five hundred thousand dollar opportunity with a company as it does to win a client for three thousand or five thousand or even ten thousand dollars. So when you just look at the idea, if you had a swimming pool and you said, How am I gonna fill up my swimming pool for the summer? You could go to the sink and you could grab a teaspoon and you could fill up that swimming pool one teaspoon at a time, or you could go get a sand bucket and you could start filling it full of buckets of water, or you could say, you know what, I'm just gonna bring this huge tanker truck in and in one hour have my whole swimming pool filled. So from that perspective, there's no question from a leverage perspective, from a cash flow perspective, you've got clients who they're not looking to move, let's say, well, I did this program this year. So next year I have to go work with a different coach and do a different program. Um, You know, that idea of sort of program hopping or I, you know what, I signed up for this program, but you know what, I can't make my payment this month. So am I allowed to pause this program. You know, you're not getting those kinds of questions from corporate. You're getting big chunks of cash up front with the deposits. The companies can pay their bills. um, And really, they're looking for experts that they can work with for years and years and years. So you've got this longevity to the client. You've got this consistency of cash flow. But all of that aside, that's all about the money. And I'm big into money because business (laughs) at the end of the day is about making a profit. But the other side, of it is the impact. And I think that's the story that we have at Bold House tried to tell more and more. Because when we look at the work that our clients are doing, folks who are going into brands, completely changing the way that they interact with diverse communities, changing the way that they take care of planet Earth, changing the way that they take care of their tens of thousands of employees, changing the way that they give back to their community. You know, when we talk about David's taking on Goliaths, what we're really talking about are David's doing some of the most profound and impactful work that's happening because most small business, not all, I mean, I'm going to draw a generalization here, but when we look at the change agents, the thought leaders who are going into these companies, these are highly conscious individuals. These are people who are doing deep spiritual work on themselves for the most part, who are very connected to universal laws, and they are these secret weapons that are going inside these companies and transforming them from the inside out. And when we see the impact of their work, it really brings tears to our eyes. It is is unbelievable, and we'll often see a major brand start to show up differently, and we know that one of our change agents is on the inside having a seat at the table really whispering into the ears of these decision makers and shifting how they're thinking and the decisions they're making and how they're showing up. And I think from an impact perspective, it's just a really beautiful story to tell. Mm. You know, I don't share this very often, but your point is profoundly impacting me in this moment. And I'm realizing way back in 1997 or 98, my company, I was working for a Fortune 500 company, my company started to hire and train with Stephen Covey. And the there was a profound transformation in how our managers started leading our teams. And they stopped managing us. They started coaching us. And it was so profound. It actually inspired me to become a coach <laughs> because I all of a sudden felt like I was seen and valued for the very first time. And so I just, I know how important it is for um, great people with great talent to be able to transform a, a group of people that are also going to transform other people. It's like the ultimate ripple. It's the ultimate ripple. And what you're really talking about there is is the story that we see over and over again. That's such a beautiful example. And that changes how you show up. And now look at how many people that you have impacted, not just through this podcast and your company, but just how you're showing up in life. I mean, you have had a huge ripple effect in this world. And so, you know, you look at that and that's one of the beautiful things. So when you sell to a company and when we say corporate, I should say to that we're really talking about all organizations because it's just an organizational sale. So whether it's a mid-market company, a nonprofit, a university, a college, a couple hundred person small enterprise or a huge Fortune 500 company, all the strategies are the same across all of that. 
And, you know, what's really interesting is you get that one yes from a decision maker and suddenly your work can just spread all the way through an entire organization. And then those people carry that work forward. And most of our clients are doing that type of transformational work that you're looking at how people show up differently, whether it's people, planet, community, um, you know, they're really doing that work. And I just... It also doesn't mean, by the way, that they don't also work with an individual if that individual wants to work with them, but so much of their reach is being fueled by the financial resources of those companies. And I, mm -hmm. there is something really interesting that happens for folks when they see their full vision of what they can do actually manifested in the world. And what I mean by that is sometimes, not always, but sometimes if you're working, let's say, with a small business owner, they would love to implement all of your ideas and everything that you see that's possible, but they don't necessarily have the resources. And then suddenly when you're able to take that vision into a company that does have more resources at their disposal, and you're able to take the vision that you see of what's possible. A great example of this is one of our clients has been working with one of the four, the, I'll say it this way to be confidential, one of the largest manufacturing companies on the planet, a company everybody listening to this show knows, and has just done some work with this company, a very old brand, and has completely transformed an issue that's been going on in their organization for decades. And she always knew that it was possible to have this impact at that level and at that scale, but to now not only see it with her own eyes, but to have the data around that impact and what happens when you do this kind of work, it will, it will change not just that company, but she's already hearing impact from those leaders that it's changing how they're showing up even at home with their families. Oh, and I think that. that's just like, it just gives me chills to think about that. Yes, I think that's why many of us are here. We 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 want to have that kind of impact on people's lives. So I love that you brought that through. You know, I think the first piece of this puzzle, besides really recognizing there's opportunity here, is knowing, okay, so how do we start landing these kinds of contracts and these kinds right. of engagements? And I'm curious, many of us are trained in sales, either for an individual transaction or one, you know, in a more corporate environment, what do you think is the biggest difference between selling one-to-one -one mm. versus selling <laughs> into a corporation? Yeah. I mean, that's easy. It's the psychology of the sale is completely different. It is completely mm. different. When you are selling to that solo buyer, it really is a completely different come from in terms of why someone is buying and the psychological process that they are going through to decide, am I going to invest my money into this thing? Even if you're a business owner, if you're small, if you're a micro business owner with under 10 folks, you are still very attached to that money as though it is you know, your money, right? And when you're selling into an organization, the psychology completely changes because now you're talking to a decision maker who number one is thinking, am I going to spend my employer's money, right? This is my employer's money. This is not my money, but I'm spending this money on behalf of the organization. The other, there's about 15 different elements to the psychology, but another one that's really easy to understand is that if we're an entrepreneur and we invest in our business, the return on investment that we get is very different. When I invest in my business, my profile can grow, my personal impact in the world can expand, my personal bank account can expand, I could have more freedom in my life, I could have more money to give back. All of these benefits are to me personally. A lot of decision makers, the majority of decision makers, when they are spending their employer's money, actually they are adding work 
to their plate. That choice to work with you means more work for them. And oftentimes, no good deed goes unpunished inside of an organization. So they're choosing to invest with you, but that's going to require more meetings. That's going to require more emails. That's going to require more justification of spend. That could be more hours that they're having to work. So it's interesting that oftentimes, even though they're a visionary as a decision maker and they want to see that benefit, there's sort of an inverse ROI for them personally each time that they're making that investment. And by the way, if it goes poorly, yes, as an entrepreneur, we're going to suffer some consequences. The consequences look very different as a decision maker who chooses the wrong vendor, who makes the wrong investment. So very, very different psychologically. And it's why so many of the strategies that folks are taught in terms of how to grow their business let's say in the online marketing or the solopreneur world, don't translate very effectively over to that B2B world. Hmm. That makes perfect sense. And so really like deepening your ability to to sell into a corporation or into an organization of some kind is a very important skill set that you need to either, like I would say master, right? Yeah. There's, you got to be able to win the business. Yes. On, it's either on or off. You can or you can't. Yes. Okay. I guess yeah. that, that selling is probably across the board, one of the most important things anybody masters, no matter who your ideal client is. But um, well, yeah. I can say having been on the other yeah. side of that sales conversation, because I, when I was in corporate, I was part of the sales team that went into, uh, we, our, our customers were um, state and local government. And really, we had to we had very specific protocols on how to do that to make sure we were getting a good ROI on our efforts. So I think yeah. it's it's super important. Yeah, but you're bringing up a really good point. No matter what business that you are in, you are not in the business that you think you are in. You are in the business of selling the services that your company provides. So if you're an executive coach, you're, you know, you're you're not in the business of coaching, you're in the business of selling executive coaching services. If you're a graphic designer, you're not in the business of graphic design, you're in the business of selling graphic design services. And this is very I think fundamentally that is the biggest block that precludes folks from really reaching their potential as business owners is the resistance to understanding that they are in the business of sales. Mic drop moment. I love that because that is so true. And you can have other skills and other passions, but sales is what we do. I thank you you for bringing that to the forefront (laughs) because I think a lot of people that scares the bejeevers out of them. Is that a word? It's not. We're making it it up. It's definitely officially a word. (laughs) Yes. Okay. It's now our word, right? It's our word. It's definitely a word. Yeah. No, it does. I think it's, it's a shame that it scares folks, but it's because it scared me so much that I was successful as I was selling in the corporate space, and I've been able to help others do it. Um, I, When I left corporate, I just wanted out, like a lot of folks, right? That was my, I, I wanted out. And um, I didn't think very far ahead that I, I just had an exit plan. I didn't have a landing plan. (laughs) So uh, a couple of weeks after I started my business, I realized I was going to have to sell my services. And I was a mess. And a good friend of mine, she was actually had been one of my employees uh, back in corporate. And we were very good friends as well. And she took me to Chili's for dinner. And I spent maybe the first half an hour just crying into my margarita and chips and salsa. Um, And finally, she was like, okay, enough of the crying. Like now it's time to get back to let's solve the problem here. And she's like, I don't know what this problem is that you have. You've spent the last decade essentially buying services. Um, I wasn't in procurement. I worked, I was always working on special projects with the, with the executive leadership team. And I was having to buy primarily professional services, but everything that you can possibly imagine shipping services to get radar systems to the Paris air show murals and models and tanks. And I mean, just everything that you can possibly manage. I I had been involved in the purchasing of those things. And um, she said, why don't you make a list? Why don't you make a list of all of the things that you absolutely hated as a as someone buying and all of the things that you absolutely loved 
to help you make the best decisions. Why don't you make that list and then just never do the things you hated when people did to you and do all of the things that you loved? <laughs> Sounds so obvious, right? But, you know, <laughs> so um, so that's what I did. That's what I did. This was back in 2006. And um, I, I ended up spending a couple of weeks doing that and met with her over lots more margaritas. And then I built out a process, which we've now spent the last, I don't even know how many years is that, let's not actually count them up, um, perfecting, perfecting that and building on that, of course, and evolving the world has changed. But essentially, that's how I started to build my approach and uh, was through the tears, the margaritas and the chips and salsa. And what was really interesting was about six months after that, I had kind of laid out a process and I contacted one of the largest companies companies that was in the area that I lived at the time, huge, huge organization. And um, about three weeks later, a senior executive reached out to me and asked me to come in and meet with them. And I kind of followed the process that I had laid out that we're still teaching to this day, just better and more refined. But I laid it out, you know, exactly what I wanted to do to have this conversation and how I wanted to approach it. And so I go in and I, and I scared to death. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was still terrified at this point. And so I have the conversation with her and she looks at me and she said, no one's ever come in here and talk to us this way before. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to hire you for any of those things just yet, but I will. I will hire you for those things. But what I want to hire you for first is I want to pick a date. I have a list of like 10 types of experts that I know that I need for this company and we need to have relationships. And I want you to go find those experts and I want you to teach them to have this conversation with us the way that you just did. And I want you to, to line them up to come in and I'll spend the whole day meeting with them. And so sitting there. So of course I said, yes, I could do that. I didn't know how I was going to do that, but I said, yes. And sure enough, I ended up lining this day out. We ended up doing two full days of these, had laid everything out for these folks. These folks ended up getting business with this major company. And then I ended up working with them for almost three years until she suddenly passed away. And then they kind of reorged and, and I, I ended up not doing more work with them. But it was for about three years. They were one of my biggest clients. Um, but that was kind of how I proved the process. And we've improved it since then. I mean, it's been a long time, but that was really right out of the gate, the journey. And one of the things, the big lesson in that for everyone is that you'll never figure out anything sitting behind your computer. The way that you really figure out, whether you sell to corporate, whether you sell to solopreneurs, whether you sell to nonprofits, whoever you sell to, the only way that you're ever really going to master it is to get out from behind your laptop and really meet with people, get out there with a minimum viable product, an MVP, you know, get out and have conversations because you don't figure it out just getting overwhelmed behind your laptop. Such great advice. And I love the origin story, really hearing how, you know, you ended up teaching other people to do what you figured out over margaritas, chips and salsa. I mean, brilliant. I love that so much. You know, um, Angelica, I want to talk about something that I think comes up for a lot of the people who are coaching in general, but specifically coaching in corporations, coaching and consulting. You talk about the time money wall. Can yes. you tell us what that is and why that can oftentimes become a barrier to scaling their businesses? Oh my goodness. And this is where most people get somewhere around six figures to 200,000 is usually where we see it. It's a little higher, but usually it's it's in that, you know, between 100 and 200,000 where the only way that they can make more money in their business is if they work more hours. So time equals money. And so we are at that time money wall. So that's it. You've put all the time and energy you 
possibly can in. And so now you're going to have to cut even deeper into your sleep, your weekends, your holidays. That's it. That's your only choice. And so folks just stop growing. That's it. That, you know, we're, we're done. And, you know, the sad thing about the time money wall is that what it has equated is that more money, which of course is more impact in the world, that more money only comes through harder work. And in fact, that's not exactly true. We are sort of raised that way, right? Our school system raises us that way and our jobs that we get, our JOBs raise us that way. Um, but yeah, it's the it's that moment where you are at your maximum capacity. And typically when you keep going with the time money wall and you don't solve it, you, you have either one of two outcomes and that's it. You either are in feast and famine cycles. Um, so you're at the feast or famine. So now you're just in delivery of what you have sold. You're eating what you've hunted and you're doing no more business development. So that pipeline is drying up. So you're in you're in the feast or famine land or you're in the burnout land. Um, and it's one or the other. And sometimes you get the double whammy of both burnout and feast or famine, which is no, which is no bueno for anybody. It's just a really bad place to be. Um, and that's where folks really start saying, you know what, I'm not even sure I want to do this anymore. Or maybe I'm just going to work with three clients. They, there's always that idea that the grass is greener on the other side, right? And so they start kind of looking around instead of saying, well, I really built this business to really just be, as Michael Gerber has said, a job for myself. And I'm working for the worst boss in the world, which is myself. Um, and that's right. I think that's probably one of my favorite quotes of his. It's just that idea that you really don't have a business, you have a job. And so that's that's really problematic and it's tough. It means no vacations, no true vacations. Um, and worse, this is the bigger one, honestly. I'm so glad you asked me about this. I don't wish what I'm saying on anyone, but this is part of life. And that is emergencies, family emergencies, aging parents, um, a kid at college that has some kind of an emergency. You yourself have a health crisis. Your house has a flood. And we had a client this past year, she had to live in temporary housing for 10 months because our whole house had to be rebuilt because of a flooding issue. You know, there will be an emergency in your life at some point in time. And when you don't build your business to actually make money when you're not working 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day, you're in trouble. And the time to build it right is when you are not in turbulence, but when you're at like a smooth altitude in your business. But that's often when people start resting on their laurels. And in fact, that's actually the time to invest in coaching. That's the time to get the training that you need. Um, to, unfortunately, a lot of folks wait until they're in the turbulence to start doing the things that are going to create the scale, create the cushion, um, really create the safety nets that they need in their business to see them through those storms when they eventually come. Hmm. Well said. I agree. I, I mean, I've hit those walls. I think we all have. And it's really understanding how to how to set things in motion uh, to scale rather than waiting until you're in so much pain, you don't have the ability to, to figure out how to do it. So I, I think that's a very important piece of this puzzle. I could talk to you for hours. I, I have so many things that I want to talk about. Uh, there's something that you've talked about, and I'm wondering if this is something we could cover really quickly since we're kind of getting to the end of our time. But it, I feel like it's so important. We've got to squeeze it in. And that is these five rules of business that you, yes. that you like you talk about it a lot. And I think it's really worth spending a couple minutes to share that. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love our five rules of business. So the first uh, rule of business is to know thyself, right? To really understand, to, to know who you are, what are your strengths? What are your inner motivators? What are your modes of action? And also what are 
all of your years of experience and knowledge, you know, it's amazing the amount of entrepreneurial amnesia that happens that folks forget, oh yeah, I was a total badass 15 years ago when I was doing X and I'm not using not even one ounce of that expertise today. So know thyself. Number two is follow the money. You've got to follow the money in business. The market is always right. And what I mean by that is the market decides what it's going to spend money on. The market decides what it wants, not you. So you've got to follow the money and you've got to put yourself where the money is naturally flowing, where that river current is going. Number three, you want to grow where you are planted, meaning where do you already have roots? What are the professional networks? What's in your own backyard? What have you already invested, you know, 20 years of building professional connections in? So grow where you're planted. You are not a tree that got ripped out and moved somewhere else. You are, you've been building roots your entire life. Don't ignore those. Number four, Think big, start small, move fast. Think big, start small, move fast. You can do so much when you are willing to get started and just do it in sprints. And last but not least, conversations are what create cash flow in your business. And I don't care what market you're in, B2B, B2C, B2G, conversations are what it's all about. And if you're not having actual conversations with the right people every single day in your business, then you're not going to make money. So those are our five rules of business. Um, and we ask our clients to live by those every single day. I love those. So good. Okay. We will outline these for you in the show notes because they're fantastic. Or you could just uh, rewind and listen to that like 70 more times today. <laughs> uh, it's worth um, making that a great uh, start to your day to review those five rules of business. Angelique, this this is powerful. And I'm I'm so profoundly moved by everything that you've shared. And I know you, like there are people here who are like, okay, how do I get with Angelique? What is a great place to start? Does she's got to have some kind of resource that we can learn more? What would be a good place for someone to start as they're listening in today? Yeah. I mean, swing by boldhouse.com. It's B-O-L-D-H-A-U-S.com. There's an awesome proposal template on there that's downloadable. It's great. It's in PowerPoint format. So you can literally stick your logo on it and use it and save a lot of headaches uh, around proposals. Um, but the other thing too is I'm the only Angelique Rewers on LinkedIn. So you can easily find me there and I would love to connect. Mm, thank you. Yeah. That proposal template's hot. So if you are working inside organizations of any kind, go download that right now because having a proven template to kind of make things easier or to optimize what you're already doing is a really valuable tool to have. Okay, Angelique, this is the moment in time where I like to ask some fun personal questions. I mean, you've already shared a little bit about your journey, which was really intriguing, but I, I know you're going to love this question. I like to ask my uh, guests, what is the boldest thing you ever did that ended up amplifying the success of your business? The boldest thing that I ever did was host my very first conference. Um, mm. I shot way over on the budget. <laughs> um, I signed a massive, insane, close to 300 thousand dollar contract with the Gaylord National in Washington, D.C. at National Harbor. Um, did not have the budget to cover that. Hindsight, that's not how you should do your first event. But I had such a vision for really putting this company on the map. And I believed so much that there was a need in the marketplace to redefine. By the way, this was 2013 when the word corporate was still a dirty word in the solopreneur land. And, um, but I knew that if I did that event and I got major brands to that event and I redefined how small business was talking with corporate and how corporate was talking to small business, that we could really do something. And, um, it was the scariest thing I ever did. I made a lot of freaking mistakes, but that put us on the map 
And it was really because I had the belief in this business and the mission. And um, that was pretty, pretty bold. And by the way, at the end of it all, I still had to write a check for $55,000 just for empty hotel rooms that I did not finish filling. But it was the best check that I ever wrote because I knew that we had just done something really important and it was worth the investment and it was okay that it all didn't work out perfectly that first time, but it was about that belief. And you've got, if you have a mission, you have to invest in it. Other people won't invest in it if you are not willing to invest in it. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And people are afraid to lose money, to, um, you know, to take these bold leaps. And I, this is such a profoundly important story you just shared. And what you may not know is that is how I heard about you was your first event and the legendary events that you put on all of a sudden were kind of going in a ripple across the influential leader <laughs> conversations and people noticed what you were doing. And I, I mean, you were already an amazing uh, expert in your own right, but it, it kind of like moved the map. I would say it like uh, put you in front of people that may not have heard of you in the same way. And so as you're listening in, if you're scared to take a bold leap, you're afraid, oh my God, is this worth it? And Angelique just shared, it's like she had to write a check for $55,000. Sometimes that leap of faith is moving mountains that you cannot move any other way. Yeah, you so. have to. And again, you know, who else is going to believe in your vision if you don't believe in your vision. And in today's market, it's not enough to just throw the same spaghetti at the social media wall that everybody else is throwing spaghetti at. To stand out, you have to be a bold player. So I love that question. And as you can probably tell from the name Bold House, we love that word as well. <laughs> yeah, I was like, she's going to love that question. Okay, last question. And I'm actually very interested to hear how you answer this one. I often find that leaders at your level, um, they can look back over the trajectory of their business and realize there was one thing they did, not usually the same bold thing, but they because they did it, it made their business smoother. It made their business better. It made their business more profitable. What is that one thing for you that you wish you would have done sooner? I wish that I would have started to systematize my business earlier, but not in the way I think a lot of people think. You know, we really have created systems to maintain our brand and to make sure that the experiences that we are creating have continuity in them. And so I think a lot of times people think of systems and CRM systems or, you know, of, in other ways. And for us, we allowed our systemization to kind of come from the brand and the brand promise and the brand experience down. And I wish I would have done that sooner. But people today, they will often say to me, we understand that you are about excellence. And I think really embracing that from the beginning, now we can run so many things so smoothly, but had I embraced that idea of that continuity of experience from the beginning, um, that I think would have just brought the maximization faster. But we're there now, and the more we lean into it, the more momentum that we gain. Mm, great example. Yeah. Thank you. Angelique, this has been amazing. As you're listening in, give Angelique some shout out, some kudos. If you want to write a review on this amazing insights that she shared or wherever you're listening, give it a little share on your socials, go check out her proposal template, download it, follow her on LinkedIn. Let's give Angelique a bunch of love for just dropping some amazing wisdom today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. 
Thanks for tuning in today, Amplifier. Be sure to join us right now in the Amplify Your Authority community at authorityamplifiers.com, and I'll share my seven proven tips to be a highly paid expert that stands out in a crowded market. Plus, we're going to keep this conversation going, and I want to hear from you how you're going to amplify your authority and make a greater impact. Before you go, please take a minute to give our show and our guests some love over on your favorite podcasting platform. Subscribe, rate, and review. Leave your full name, and I'll spotlight you and your authority on social media. 